Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I've entitled this sermon, A Different Way to Say It, and I thought it'd be appropriate to kind of explain that here in this setting for our 1030 service. I couldn't help but think about that there is a different way to say things during this service because we have an online audience. And so when I told them this morning to, if you had a Bible, to open it up to 1 John chapter 5, I had forgotten the verse, and I wish I had written it down, but verse 13 for you online. I wanted you to get a first glance at the word of John and how it was being used for us, those that hear the word of God. What was John's purpose? And for you who get the uh, hint, hint, hint there, well, you'll get to see it in that text. But for you here, well, you'll just have to be in a little bit of suspense. When will pastor actually read that verse from the Bible for us and explain what John is getting at? Well, first off, who is this John, St. John, that we commemorate today? The 27th of December is John the Evangelist's feast day. And it commemorates him because... He was a faithful follower of Christ and specifically wrote quite a bit of the New Testament, including the Gospel of John, three letters of John, and Revelation. Each of these texts has its moment of glory and often is quoted, and you might have heard in the reading something that we use in our liturgy from uh, our, our lectionary this morning. In our Gospel text today, Peter asked that really awkward question. You know, I can't imagine John being there and hearing Peter say, well, how is he going to die, Jesus? John says, I wasn't thinking about my death, but thank you, Peter. Yeah, he asked that question, and Jesus says, well, that's not for you to decide. John, interestingly enough, is the only apostle who's generally regarded as, well, living to an old age and dying a natural death. The other apostles all martyred and sometimes in very specific ways. Peter crucified upside down. John is a little bit different from the rest of the disciples and we see that in his gospel text. It's different from the other three texts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which are considered the synoptic gospels. It just means that they follow a similar timeline of Jesus' ministry and speak about similar events. John's gospel is a little bit different. And one of those ways is that he doesn't include the Lord's Prayer or even the Lord's Supper, though these critical Christian doctrines are interwoven within his message as he talks about them in a little bit of a different way. And speaking of John speaking a little bit differently to us, he does include some wonderful events of Jesus' life for us to consider and think about and believe. One of those that's really nuanced is Jesus talking to the Pharisee Nicodemus. See, the setting kind of blows by us when we read it and we focus on the words rather than what's going on. Jesus talks, about, talks to Nicodemus in the middle of the night in secrecy about a new birth of water and spirit, as we know it, baptism. An interesting way to tell the story. In John's gospel, he also includes something that's not in the other gospels, and something I find very important for your faith, the raising of Lazarus. Well, why is that important for you? Well, Lazarus is a reminder that what happened to Jesus after he died, the being raised from the dead in glory, well, it's true for you. And Jesus showed that that truth is a reality for us, that on the last day, we will all be raised from the dead, just like Christ was raised from the dead. So these wonderful stories interwoven with John's gospel paints to us just something a little bit different. He speaks the truth, but has a different way to say it. And speaking of a different way to say it, 
Well, we're in the middle of the Christmas season. The pyramids are still white. We still have the Advent and Christ candle. And the decorations are still out marking Christmas. John has a different way of talking about Christmas, the birth of Christ. He doesn't talk like Luke about the wonderful event surrounding Mary and Joseph in that stable, but rather talks about it in a very poetic way. And in fact, that reading was used during Christmas Day for that sermon. That was the gospel text about the Word becoming flesh, the Word dwelling with us. John wrote those words for Christmas to remind us of the birth of Christ, that it truly is God with us. The Word becoming flesh, dwelling with us, and Christ, Jesus, ministering to us. John makes it very apparent that Christmas marks the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. John knows this and writes his gospel in a different, different way to get across what is important for your faith life. John is writing so that the ministry of Christ would affect you and that you might believe. And in fact, for those listening online, that's what I wanted you to see in 1 John 5, 13. And for those here listening, waiting in suspense for this, this is what John has to say for you. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. John wants you to read these things and believe and know that you have life eternal and that with God. John writes this very subject in all of his texts. John 20 uh, from the gospel, verse 30. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. He makes it very apparent. He wants you to believe after hearing these words read to you. Even in his last book, Revelation chapter 1, right at the beginning, he says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. He wants you to keep these words, the holy word of God, in your heart and on your mind so that you would believe. Believe that Christ had come into the world on Christmas Day to live a life and to be your Savior. Indeed, John makes very apparent in his gospel two very important things for you. That the child born to us is God and the Messiah. And remember, the Messiah just means the appointed one or anointed one. And it's the same thing meaning for Christ. He wants you to know that little child is God and has come for you to be your Savior. Again, that person who lays in the manger is God. A lot of you have nativity scenes at home. As we talked about it during Advent, I heard about some of your nativity scenes. And most of you have a little Jesus in a bed of hay in a feeding trough. And that little child... That little cute child is indeed a symbol of God with us. That baby, he is the word made flesh. He is the light. He is the love of God. He was also the one appointed to be your redeemer, your savior. For each one of you, he was the one who would become the one responsible for your sins, to die for them. That precious little child is your salvation. You know, uh, a question is, comes to mind when we think about that little child. I think about my own little child here and what she will do when she grows up. And I'd imagine a lot of parents 
have held their child as, as a small baby and thought, what will they do? Who will they become? What great things will they do? And our children here, I imagine, you wonder what you will grow up to be, a, maybe a firefighter, a policeman, maybe even president of the United States. What wonderful things that we think of our children as they grow up and what they will do. And indeed, what we wish we can do. Jesus was a precious little child held in the arms of his parents, Mary and his earthly father, Joseph. Joseph was told by an angel that Jesus would come to save his people from their sins. Joseph, being a man of God, would probably know what that meant, what it was referring to. In order to save someone from their sins, something must die. A sacrifice must be made. So this little child, only a few hours old, held in his parents' arms, well, they looked upon this Jesus. They knew what great thing he would do, but it would be a terrible thing. This small child in their arms would suffer and die. He would be the sacrifice for all the wrong in the world. He would take upon himself the suffering that was intended for us. I can imagine tears were in the eyes of Joseph and Mary, knowing that was the great thing intended for this child, to die, to suffer, to take on the sins of the most wretched and all of us as well, and to be the forgiveness that we need. This death was indeed a great act of love. And that is what we celebrate at Christmas, the birth of our sacrifice. But we also have to remember, as I said before, that Christmas is the mark of the beginning of Christ's earthly ministry. And John writes about this and talks about how grand it is. Verse 25 from our gospel text. Now, there are many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose, that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Could not contain all of Jesus' ministry. I had a hard time thinking about that and realizing what that might be, so I I meditated on this. I thought, even if you wrote about every single footstep, every grain of sand that got caught between the toes of Jesus, the strands of hair, you would eventually run out of things to write about, right? Right? You'd eventually cover everything, and especially in a digital age that we are in, where a book only takes a few kilobytes. You can imagine that we would be able to store the very life of Jesus, the story about him. Well, I had to do a little bit more digging. So I went onto Amazon, and they sell books. So I had to see how many books are written about the Bible. And their search caps out at 100,000. And indeed, even if you search for four stars and above for the books related to Bible, there is still over 100,000 books in their entries. Incredible. Incredible that there have been that many books written about the Bible. I want to get a little bit more specific, and I looked up Christmas. And there were still over 100,000 entries for books on Christmas. Indeed, the ministry of Christ is vast and has affected many people. The thing is, the ministry of Christ expands to all of you and has affected you personally. You have the story of how Jesus has been in your personal life. And each of you probably could write a vast book a novel about how God has affected you in your life, affected your friends and family and those around you. You too are in the same boat John is in, that you write about the ministry of Christ with your own words. You tell about it so that others would believe. And in fact, if you were to write down everything that Jesus had done, it'd be a massive undertaking, maybe too much to even 
think about and write. But each of you, like John, has something to say and say it a bit different so that it would affect those around you in the way that God intends. Thinking about John and commemorating him this day reminds us that we have a story, a truth told to us so that we would have faith and believe that Christ is ours, that he came to be our salvation, that he's born to be God. John, in his way of writing about Jesus, touches on three themes. And these are things that I would encourage you to look at as you read your scriptures. John writes about the fact that Jesus is the light of the world. And in him there is no darkness. Indeed, wherever darkness is, light can always overcome it. Darkness can never envelop light. Light always rids darkness and shadow. John also writes about the fact that Jesus is love, and indeed, God is love. And Jesus shows us the total mercy of God and how he loves his people so much that he dies for us. Us who have no reason to gain heavenly life, but only because the Lord has mercy on us and forgives us of our sins. Because of that forgiveness, Jesus is life. He is your life eternally and indeed your life now. As you go about your day, Jesus sends a helper in the Holy Spirit so that you would have a sanctified life, obeying and being in God's word. In all of these things, Jesus is the light, love, and life that is given to you. And John would have you know this. He would tell you to talk about this child born on Christmas Day as being the light, love, and life of the world. And to speak about it in your own unique and different way. You are a continuation of the gospel of the Lord speaking about what he has done for you, saving you from sin and drawing you close to him. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus.